I'm very happy to be presenting to you today our remote viewing application survey and a little bit about the recent history of remote viewing. My name is Deborah Lynn Katz and my co-author is Dr. Patrizio Trisoldi. So the purpose was to discover which projects professional level remote viewers are engaged with today and to what extent. We wanted to understand their backgrounds, methods, approaches, practices, philosophies, beliefs, and phenomenological experiences related to this work. And another goal was to discover whether the original definitions and tenets of remote viewing defined within its specific historical context have changed. So recruitment. We were able to recruit 106 remote viewers, uh, even though we then consistently had between 70 and 73 three responses per question. We used snowball sampling, which meant we recruited from uh, groups like the International Remote Viewing Association and the Applied Precognition Project and other lists of viewers that had participated in research projects. And then we asked them to invite their friends, but only remote viewers who had applied experience. And we really kept that, um, the term um, remote viewer uh, it, it had to apply to somebody that was uh, operating out of the historical definition of remote viewing. So it couldn't just be someone who uses the term remote viewing synonymously with clairvoyance or out-of-body experiences. They had to really be part of the remote viewing definition as far as it's been historically defined, which is that remote viewing is not just a psychic ability, it's, it's a setup. Within the setup, the, an experimental protocol, that's how Ingo Swan defined it, it's not that it has to be a, a highly particular method, but it does have to be done with, within uh, a certain uh, careful setup. And so people that are from that tradition understand that. And so we express that in our materials and in our participation agreement to narrow things down. So we didn't just put out a notice like to the 45,000 a person Reddit group because we were afraid we would just get too many people not really understand that we were narrowing our definition. And so we had, we had 59 men and 42 women and to non-gender. It was really great to see the broad array of professions. So we had a tax analyst, a financial auditor, insurance claims adjuster. Uh, we had registered nurses and software engineers, geophysicists, law enforcement officers, teachers, artists, nutritionists, pharmacists, and uh, several were, re were retired. And then five only five indicated as their main professions that they were psychics, mediums, remote viewers, and remote viewing project managers. And again, they had to be remote viewers. Uh, they, if they were only mediums, they couldn't participate. But if they were remote, remote viewers and mediums, then they could participate. Training level, well, 90% indicated they had received some remote viewing training, 80% having received a moderate amount, and only 9% responded none at all. Um, and even with that, it was interesting because as, as the ones that said that they didn't have remote viewing training, in, uh, we figured out that that was mostly, it wasn't formal training, but they had watched videos. Or they used certain language that came uh, specifically from the history of remote viewing, so we knew at least in some way that they were influenced by it. What methodology have participants been trained in mostly? Well, 64 people stated that they were trained in controlled remote viewing, uh, extended remote viewing, which is less structured and involves going into a deeper brainwave state. That was 26 people were trained in that methodology. Um, 18 people said that they were only trained in associative remote viewing. Um, which means that they would know how to do more um, uh, sessions for financial forecasting or for sports, which involves uh, a process where photographs are paired with uh, the outcomes of different uh, events, and then they have to describe the photograph that's going to be shown to them after the event. And so all they really have to be able to do for that is to to describe a photograph enough for a manager to know which photo they're describing. So that takes less uh, skill level and there's a much less involved than if 
someone had to describe where a missing person was or something like that. So 18 per people were trained in that. And then 28 uh, had other methods or a combination. So um, uh, how experienced were these people? 80% completed more than 100 remote viewing sessions they reported, and one third had completed more than 500 sessions. How long have you practiced remote viewing? We asked, and uh, let's see, we had 17 who had practiced for longer than 20 years. Uh, and you can see it was um, pretty much evenly distributed. Most of our people had been practicing at least for one to two years, and then it was evenly divided um, for the next uh, time periods after that. How many total remote viewing sessions have you completed in your life, including practice? 80% had more than 100 sessions, and over half stated more than 300 sessions. Uh, they also reported they uh, eight, out of 82, 72 people, so 87% had been involved in other meditation methods, and these really spanned a, a wide range of practices. So meditation and also other psychic development practices before coming into remote viewing. And so our results, uh, what you've all been waiting for. So we, our main findings is that remote viewing applications are wide, spanning from business to scientific and intelligence applications and for the use of personal, corporate, and public agencies. And I'm now going to go over what some of those applications are, but you could see in this slide there are many of them. Uh, so we'll go over that now. Financial forecasting. 47 people out of the 73 viewers had used remote viewing for stock market related predictions, uh, stock market increase de decreases, uh, the S&P 500, Forex, uh, the Dow, commodity markets, cryptocurrency or crypto viewing, as it is called today, and then particular stocks, health and movement of those stocks. Business consulting, out of 77, 35 people, uh, about 45% reported having done remote viewing for business consulting. Uh, and this involved when to buy or sell investments, marketing trends, tariff negotiations, technological choices, projects for business owners that needed more information before making financial and marketing decisions, and also for optimal trajectories. Weather events and dis disaster forecasting out of 71, 39 respondents, about a little more than half, answered that they have used remote viewing for uh, the development of the global climate. Uh, well, one person said that, not exactly sure what that means, but direction of storms, uh, requirements for infrastructure repairs, and then different projects where managers or individuals really wanted to know what is going to be happening either within a specific time period or a broader range out into the future. And political elections, um, this, this is, is what we got here. So they have done uh, for UK elections, local elections, the Brexit outcome, uh, and predicting the uh, last presidential elections. And then COVID pandemic. Several remote viewers indicated that they had used remote viewing to understand various aspects of the COVID virus and ongoing pandemic. So COVID-19 mandates, when will those be over? One person said, I did a COVID-19 project back in mid-January, highly accurate, uh, predicting the course of Boris Johnson's COVID infection. By the way, we had remote viewers from all over the world. So we had several from the United States, from the UK. We had people from Ireland and Scotland and Brazil, uh, from Japan, all over. Uh, scientific topics. So this included not uh, remote viewers involved in experiments, but those that were using their remote viewing to understand some kind of topic that falls under the uh, larger topic of science. So people said they had used remote viewing for cures for cancer, EMF, gravity, light, and brain function, again, COVID, other diseases, other viruses, CRISPR genes, levitation, the ability to reconstitute stone, super elastic metals, future technology, AI, and research to advance knowledge of, of remote viewing or psi or viruses. So we can study psi through use of psi. 
uh, remote viewing for physical health diagnosis and healing out of 76 respondents, 42 responded, again, a little over half, that they did do a remote viewing for their self, family, friends, and clients where they did things to help seriously ill people uh, who would go on to recover. So they use their abilities to help other medical professionals for decision-making, for influencing or healing, investigating mental health or clients, uh, uh, the, investigating the mental health uh, for clients that had asked they wanted to know about someone else in their lives, um, pets. So there were quite a few responses throughout our survey where remote viewing was used to help pets and to help people who had pets answer questions. Um, and there were several comments about ethics and legal concerns. So some remote viewers said, no, we don't do anything like this. It would be unethical in case we were incorrect or, or we could get into trouble if we did anything having to do with medical. So there was uh, definitely some concerns expressed there. Also, criminal investigations. Uh, this has been a topic that psychics have um, been involved in for a long time, and it looks like 48% uh, of our participants had been involved in cases involving kidnapping, missing persons, finding dead bodies, identifying lost people, arson, fugitive location, homicides, personality profiling, forecasting terrorist events, and theft. Criminal investigations, who is the client? Well, these were detectives, federal and local law enforcement, remote viewing groups and instructors, and family members. Uh, also, we did ask about intelligence investigations, and only 27 of our participants, which were, was 36%, responded yes. Several viewers indicated that they did not feel comfortable discussing their work on criminal cases due to non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality issues. Now, this is something I do want to take a pause here and say, uh, this, this came up a lot, uh, much more so than we anticipated. This came up even when we were recruiting people that they said that we were asking them questions they weren't, or they were afraid we would ask them questions that they weren't able to answer. These were personal about their, their own income as their professional income as remote viewers. They were concerned about violating non-disclosure agreements. This also came up a lot around our questions around corporates and, and businesses. And it is some concern because uh, it's already been hard enough to learn about uh, people's, uh, what they're doing on, on a psychic level out there. And now it seems like more and more um, businesses are requiring non-disclosure agreements for remote viewers, and they really take this seriously. So also, uh, searching for missing people, pets, and items. So this is a quite a big one. We had out of 77 people, 57 people um, said that they use remote viewing for uh, searching for missing people, pets, items, looking for things is, is a big one. 66% said they look for missing objects, missing guns, books, planes, jewelry, earphones, wallets. This is for their themselves, family, friends, and clients. And then archaeological projects, this was archaeological projects was first were first uh, made popular by Stephen Schwartz, who's, who I'm sure everyone here is really familiar with the Alexandria project um, or his underwater project. So these types of projects seem to be consider, seem to be continuing today. Dowsing for water holes, searching for artifacts such, such as dinosaur bones, discovering what is underneath existing structures archaeological sites prior to excavation, searching for precious metals such as gold. One respondent said, apart from the old aircraft, a lost treasure in Pennsylvania for a client, finding missing money the client buried and then left the area and came back and it was gone. These types of projects are problematic though, as treasure hunters do not want to pay upfront for projects and often disappear following the receipt of remote viewing information. So that was stated, uh, uh, repeated 
in different responses that sometimes uh, there's a problem in either not getting feedback or once the client or company gets the information, they don't really hear from them again. That was not for everyone, but that was voiced. Uh, other ones said that they have clients that are repeat clients sometimes for uh, a decade. So esoteric unexplained phenomenon. So UFOs, alien life forms, lights in the sky, orbs, planetary bodies. Many are familiar with Ingo Swan's work where he remote viewed Jupiter or, or um, other planets. And so this is something that people are continuing to do. And mis uh, discovering mysterious locations such as Skinwalker Ranch, underground tunnels and caverns, subterranean pyramids, runes, portals, uh, old places in Antarctica, the, the source of cattle mutilation, strange sounds in Kiev, the Great Pyramid of Egypt and its origins, unusual objects and ancient artifacts. Now, it was expressed with these that usually there's not any kind of hard feedback. So some remote viewers don't like to do these, but others do them just out of their own interest. And also, if many remote viewers get the same responses, then it's thought that there, this might lend some um, legitimacy to what one viewer is getting, or if it corresponds with personal exceptional experiences out there. Uh, which remote viewing techniques, approaches, methods do you prefer for applied projects? Um, we asked that question. The majority use the methods we talked about before, uh, such as controlled remote viewing, extended remote viewing, but they mix these up. They change with the with time or with the subject matter, and sometimes they use multiple methods within a session or sometimes within different uh, between different projects. There were 15 participants who said they use controlled remote viewing exclusively and some viewers listed as many as working with four different methods at any given time. Several viewers mentioned that they do like to do associative remote viewing um, as it can be done quickly and for this they do not stick to the same protocols they would use for other types of applied projects. It should be noted that even for the responses where viewers said they use only their own methods, it is clear to the researchers that from some of the language used, such as ideograms or analytic overlay, that they at least borrow concepts from controlled remote viewing. Other methods also were dowsing. Working with groups who are alone, uh, out of 73, 51 people, so this would be 69%, did say that they work with a group who is the leader and the, the group leader then interfaces with the client. So the remote viewing, the remote viewer doesn't have to uh, talk to the client and deal either with their emotions or risking um, getting front loaded. And you'll hear me talk about front loading here for a minute or two, and that has to do with receiving information up front about the nature of the project. So for example, if someone had a missing wedding ring and they said, I want you to find my wedding ring, that is the front loading, find my wedding ring. Uh, they're they're uh, hopefully not gonna say more than that because remote viewers don't like to have, they don't wanna hear, uh, I think my wedding ring fell into the kitchen sink or the last time I saw it was in the bathroom. No, that would be way too, that would just be extra noise. So remote viewers don't wanna work with that. Some of them indicated that they do like to know it's a wedding ring. Others would say, no, I don't even want to know that. So um, uh, working with a group and a leader makes it so that they don't have to be exposed to that extra information. Um, but then 48 did say that they sometimes work directly with clients. And then some said they work with a partner who interfaces with the client. Uh, and that partner was sometimes a spouse or a boyfriend, girlfriend, um, sometimes uh, um, just a friend, uh, and swapping roles. So some of the remote viewers indicated that they operate as project managers and judges and, and things like that as in addition to remote viewing. Uh, blinding protocols. Do you feel like it is always possible or practical to use? Uh, so 36 felt that it is always possible or practical to do remote viewing sessions blind. 47 responded, no, it's not always practical. Attitudes about adherence to blinding protocols fluctuated from a hardlined approach to those who saw such approach and dogmatic and uh, just less practical. Um, so what level of front-loading do you 
prefer to work with. Over half of the respondents responded no front loading. And again, these largely corresponded with those who indicated they always work blind. Some were adamant against receiving front loading. They said any front loading necessarily brings the logical mind into play, and that is never a good thing in remote viewing. I don't want to know if it's a missing person. I go into every single target knowing that there's a potential for blood, gore, sex, criminal activity, or whatever. And then another wrote, I believe that the less I know about the target, the more my unconscious mind does the work. Front loading, half of participants do work with some. And then front loading themes, working with front loading was noted to be a higher level skill. So some said that they hope in the future that they could work with it, where they would know more about the target uh, and what whatever a client might expose to them. But they said at this point, they don't feel like they can do as good a session with that information. Success, how does a viewer define success? So they said, um, first and foremost, accuracy and then usefulness. And then they, some said the client defined success. Some of them said it was situational, so that will change depending on the target and the purpose of the project. Professional presentation, um, they feel successful if they have delivered something with a polished summary, with beautiful sketches. Uh, managing emotional responses, this was talked about a lot. Remote viewers get nervous when they're doing sessions. They have performance anxiety. They're, they don't know many times what they're dealing with. When, when they are blind, they have no idea what the topic is and what the purpose is. That creates a lot of anxiety. And so how well do they manage that? That could lead to more of a successful session and they can also feel better if they feel like they manage their emotions properly. And then out of um, earnings, uh, out of 64 responses, only four people um, really said that how much they earn has anything to do with their success. And then the performance of the group that they're working with, if they're working in a group, how are other people performing and what's the overall group result? It's not just about them. Yes. What do the remote viewers clients express that they appreciate about them? So remote viewers felt what their clients appreciate is accuracy, clarity, consistency, and detailed information, ability to work with, with little to no front loading, blinding, professionalism in reporting, summarizing, describing, and communicating, stretching, um, clients exhibit strong emotional or uh, sketching, not stretching, but sketching. Uh, uh, clients have reported that they appreciate the view viewers can produce uh, accurate sketches and detailed sketches. And also clients exhibit strong emotional responses. Uh, so many remote viewers said that their clients will actually cry um, over the information that they receive. They'll be so grateful that someone um, is helping them with their problems or that someone is taking them seriously. Um, the, sometimes their clients are also intuitive and they appreciate that there's people out there doing this work. Um, and clients exhibit also appreciation that they were aided with their finances. They had good outcomes financially and thank the remote viewers for that. And then one of my favorite findings was when we asked the question of remote viewers, what do you enjoy most about remote viewing applications work? And we were really surprised at the extreme high intensity uh, words that were expressed. Many remote viewers, they think it was at least five said that remote viewing makes them high. They feel high from doing it. Now, I think that this is an area that really deserves further exploration. I'm not sure, are they feeling high while they're doing the session or are they feeling high afterwards when they get their feedback and see they were correct? It might be, it might be both. Uh, they didn't say they always feel this way, but they just voice so much excitement. And as you can see in the background, I, I created a word cloud that encompasses the most uh, repeating words. So you can see high, uh, fascinating, uh, appreciation, uh, love it all. Um, as one viewer said, this is the most fascinating thing I've ever encountered in my life. And this um, love it all, the just all aspects. Uh, so this was really cool to see. And it would be interesting to, uh, to 
see how does this correspond with brain research into remote viewing. I know at the Monroe Institute in the University of Virginia right now, they're doing brain research. And it'd be just interesting to see if you could co correlate uh, what's happening in the brain when the viewers are, are having this experience of euphoria. Um, they said that they, they got so much insight and learning out of what they were doing. And they also expressed uh, extreme appreciation that they have an opportunity to help others in this way. And oftentimes it's helping people who've gone to other sources for help and just um, the sometimes remote viewing is their last resort. Um, they loved it when they got feedback, especially positive feedback. And they said that there was a metaphysical and spiritual element also. Not everyone expressed this, but many people did. And then also the benefits. They said that remote viewing helps them with their personal growth, with learning, um, with insights, again, with helping others, knowing that they're uh, helping people. Challenges. Um, many challenges were voiced. Difficulty turning down logic, having patience, focus, my left brain trying to label everything, can't reach 100% accuracy, meeting deadlines, finding quiet time, uh, emotional impact after feedback. And then sometimes despite the information they give, the cases still have negative outcomes such as um, giving accurate information about where a missing person is, but the person isn't found in time. So the person is found in a location that corresponds with their descriptions, and yet they weren't found in time and the person has perished. Other challenges, not in control of what happens with the information. So they sometimes give clients information, your wallet is in your car in the back seat and the client can't find it for a while. And then um, by weeks later, um, it's, they're, they're told, oh yeah, you were right, but you had to go for several weeks thinking that you weren't right. Uh, so tasking, um, sometimes the tasking, again, tasking is the thing that the remote viewer is supposed to be describing. Sometimes it's confusing or unclear, or too broad, or failed to address that which needs to be known. And sometimes this is the fault of the client. Uh, sometimes this is the fault of project managers. Conclusion, uh, scientific principles are still being carried forward. Remote viewing for applications work continues to be carried out in the spirit in which it was intended. We found it's been carried out for practical use and as an informational gathering tool by articulate, thoughtful, and engaged participants. We found that most respondents express both awareness of and respect for the scientific principles related to blinding and separation of roles, yet there was a range of views regarding the practicality of adhering to these for applications purposes. And I'd like to just thank all of you. And also, if you want to learn more about applications, and particularly applications having to do with pre predicting outcomes for sports, politics, finances, and the lottery, you can check out my new book with my co-author, John Knowles, a 700-page book where we cover the formal scientific literature, a lot of parapsychology-oriented literature, and then also we focus on what remote viewers are doing today in these areas as individuals and groups and organizations. All right, now looking forward to our discussion.